Welcome back to the sixth episode of DeepMind, the podcast. My name is Hannah Fry. I am a mathematician who's worked with data and algorithms for the last decade or so. And I've spent the last year at DeepMind, an organisation that is trying to solve intelligence and then use it to solve some of society's problems. There are an awful lot of people working in the field of artificial intelligence, moving forward our understanding of the whole area. And for many of them, it is a terrifically exciting place to be. We're breaking new frontiers of problem solving and seeing great leaps ahead. But before any of that hits the outside world, the first inklings of new breakthroughs here at DeepMind come in the form of regular poster sessions. Our goal here was to um, have a model that can carry out the following simple task, where I'm going to give you a number and a secret symbol, and what the sum between those two are, and you have to infer from that what the value of the symbol is. But it requires our agents to have some properties that we think are desirable, like learning to learn, uh, like having a memory, and processing those memories. And so We're studying analogical reasoning. And logical reasoning is very important because it's uh, key to scientific discovery and also human reasoning. The main question we ask is how can we design neural networks that are able to do analogical reasoning? My poster is about verification of neural networks. In this day and age when we deploy neural networks into the real world applications, we want to make sure that these neural networks are safe. For example, if you have an image classifier, we don't ever want to predict a cat to be like a car or something like that. I always say DeepMind is a bit like academia on steroids. Like it is still academia, but we have a lot of compute, a lot of great people clustered together, a lot of help to like manage ourselves. So yeah. While there is obvious excitement about AI research, this new era of artificial intelligence also comes with concerns. There is unease about the way it might be implemented, used and abused. For the rest of this episode, we are looking at the more human side of technology and the fight to find a future of AI that works for everyone. In 2017, DeepMind set up dedicated teams working on how AI impacts ethics and society, with the aim of making sure that the algorithms designed in this building are a positive force for good. But hang on, I know what you're thinking. Surely algorithms aren't ever good or bad in and of themselves. It's how they're used that matters. After all, GPS was invented to launch nuclear missiles and now helps to deliver pizzas. And speakers playing pop music on repeat have been deployed as a torture device. Isn't the technology itself just neutral? Good question. And um, I think something a lot of people say and believe, and I can see why they say that. This is Verity Harding, co-lead of DeepMind Ethics and Society. I think there's a famous saying about... um, As long as there's been fire, there's been arson. You can use something that's for good, you can use it for bad. But I think actually as we're developing increasingly sophisticated technologies that have real impact on people's lives, it's not really an acceptable thing to say. You can't be building something that's going to have this kind of monumental impact or potentially transformative impact and not care about how it's going to be used. Is that part of the concern then, that technology that might have been built for one purpose ends up being used in a different way? I think definitely that's some of it. I think definitely that's some of it, because you could foresee a situation where you're building a facial recognition tool because you want to allow somebody to quickly find pictures of their husband or wife or mum or dad, and that's a great thing. But that facial recognition technology, once developed could, of course, be used to target political dissidents and pick them out of a crowd, you know. And so I think that is definitely one of the concerns, that you might create something for one purpose and it be used for another. On the topic of facial recognition, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, recently refused a request by a US police department to install their algorithm in cop cars and body cameras. And he's publicly called for more careful thought and societal dialogue about potentially regulating the use of the technology. 
And here at DeepMind more generally, there is a strong sense that the people behind the science have a duty to investigate the wider and perhaps less predictable impacts of their work. I don't think it's okay to build something, whether that be a a product or a service, and put it out there and and just, just hope that you make the world a better place. I think it's important that you are deliberate and intentional about why you're building this, who are you building it for, what are you hoping to do, what is your intention with this technology. And if you start from that premise, then I think you're more likely to get to a better outcome where you do the good that you hoped you were going to do. The problem is that without these steps, it is very easy for unintentional consequences to creep up on you. You only need to look at the news stories about social media from the past few years to see just how much algorithms have changed our society in unexpected ways. Lila Ibrahim is DeepMind's COO and has over 20 years' experience working in the tech sector. She has seen firsthand how hard a booming industry has found it to keep up with being responsible. In 2006, I went into the middle of the Amazon and we built a computer lab and uh, healthcare. So we put in internet and computers, etc. We knew we had a responsibility not to just leave it there, but to train folks to take care of it, to think about the sustainability. But I think that's kind of where things tend to end. Ethics means something very different now, and responsibility means something very different now because technology is in everybody's hands. It's no longer limited to a few people for a specific application. Um, it's a lot easier to get into the tech sector and to make technology that can have value to people. And at the same time, that comes a lot of responsibility that I don't think, in general, the tech sector has taken into account. But the last few years have shown how hugely transformative and disruptive AI can be and brought sharply into focus the very possible negative outcomes of ill-thought-through technology. But as Verity told me, the tide is slowly beginning to turn. Much of the drive for a conversation about ethics is coming from within the technology community itself. Three years ago in 2016, some of the scientists from different uh, labs at different companies uh, met at a conference and were talking about how excited they were about the potential for AI to do a lot of good, uh, but acknowledging that a technology that's so powerful that it has the potential to be transformative in a very good way must also have the potential to be transformative in, uh, in, in not so good a way. And so they came together to say, well, what can we do about it? And so the partnership on AI was born. It includes members from Amnesty International, Electronic Frontier Foundation, the BBC and Princeton University, amongst many, many others. And together they're hoping to come up with best practices in AI – making sure that society stays firmly at the forefront of engineers' minds. So the partnership on AI, interestingly, was founded by the biggest tech companies. So it was founded by by DeepMind, but also Google, Facebook, Amazon, IBM and Apple. One thing that's really interesting about the partnership on AI is that the board membership is made up of independent board members and representatives of the company. And so it's creating a space where those different groups aren't siloed from each other, having debates in different rooms and not listening, but somewhere where honest people with the best of intentions can come together and challenge each other and scrutinise each other and hold each other accountable, but also have frank, open, honest debate about issues where reasonable people can disagree. I really believe that the outcome of that will be better decision making both in companies, but, but elsewhere as well. Does it sometimes get quite heated? in those conversations? You know, my experience of it is that it doesn't get heated, but it, it's, it's passionate. So people aren't um, angry with each other and there's there's not aggressive argument, but people are very honest and very open and very challenging. But that's been received really well in, in all cases. How do you protect against rogue companies just who are not part of these groups just doing whatever they want? If enough companies and enough groups sign up to something and it becomes the norm, it's then really obvious when people aren't doing it. And I do think uh, people being kind of called out for that, it will no longer be tenable to to not operate in the way that everybody else is operating. 
It's not just theoretical concerns about runaway applications of AI that's prompting these conversations, but real examples of algorithms that have already been let loose on the world with real question marks about whether their benefits outweigh their harm. A notorious example is the use of AI in the criminal justice system. Now, you may have heard of these algorithms already. When a defendant appears in court, the AI can assess a defendant's chances of going on to commit another crime in future. And that risk score is then used by a judge to help decide whether the defendant should be awarded bail, and in some cases, how long someone's sentence should be. There is good justification for something like this because there is an enormous amount of luck involved in the human judicial system. Studies have shown that if you take the same case to a different judge, you will often get a different response. If you take the same case to the same judge on a different day, you'll often get a different response. Judges don't like giving the same response too many times in a row, and so if a series of successful cases of bail hearings have gone before you, your chances of being successful fall. And there is even evidence to suggest that judges tend to be a lot stricter in towns where the local sports team has lost recently. Using AI to help make these decisions can help to eliminate a lot of that inconsistency. But you have to tread pretty carefully. If you, without thought and care and due attention to the history of racial prejudice in the criminal justice system, build something that claims to be able to predict somebody's likelihood of reform and rehabilitation and reoffending, then it is likely, at least in my view, that that's going to fail. If you build something with the intention of addressing those biases and you work to include the community in some way, you know, could there potentially be a beneficial outcome? Maybe, but I haven't seen it yet. And by fail, you're really talking about treating black defendants differently to white defendants. Absolutely. And once you tend to look at the algorithms and the data that they've been they've been built on, um, oftentimes you can see, well, they were built on data that was already biased. So, of course, this was the outcome. The issue came to public attention in 2016 after a group of US investigative journalists from ProPublica published a damning report of one particular company's criminal risk scores. Their study showed that the algorithm was twice as likely to wrongly categorise black defendants as being likely to re-offend than white defendants. Now, I should just point out that DeepMind does not build these systems, but the whole industry, alongside the partnership in AI, has been part of the conversation of how to address them. One of those people is William Isaac, a social scientist at DeepMind. He says that the 2016 ProPublica investigation made people realise that switching over to algorithms doesn't make decisions any more objective. Even with AI and ML tools, you are getting into the social environment where you actually have the same norms, the same kind of like systematic biases. They're still all present. So it's really hard to say that somehow this will replace all of the kind of subjective preconceived notions about certain groups or historical biases against them and that you can start all over again. And so I think that was the wake up call was that is not as objective as it seems, and that as a result, we still have to grapple with those questions. The problem is that the data which gives the algorithm predictive abilities are questions like, how many times were you arrested as a juvenile? But if you are, say, a young black man in America, it doesn't matter how law-abiding you are, the chances are that you will have had many more negative interactions with the police than someone exactly like you who happened to be white. And if you're using that data to dictate who deserves to be given bail or not, then you're in serious risk of perpetuating societal imbalances going forwards. This is Sylvia Chiappa, a staff research scientist at DeepMind. Researchers don't fully understand what this fairness is about. They also look like a messy area in the sense that it involves, it is not purely technical problem, and it's very difficult to understand what, how to define fairness, uh, and it's difficult to separate the technical part from uh, the ethical one. 
This is an important point because defining exactly what you mean by fair is surprisingly tricky. Of course, you'd want an algorithm that makes equally accurate predictions for black and white defendants. The algorithm should also be equally good at picking out the defendants who are likely to reoffend whatever racial group they belong to. And, as ProPublica pointed out, the algorithm should make the same kind of mistakes at the same rate for everyone, regardless of race. Ethically, you'd want all of those things to be true. But technically, that's not always going to be possible. If your dataset has bias in it, there are some kinds of fairness that are mathematically incompatible with others. And even if you could guarantee all of these things, there are still a number of ethical issues to contend with. How do you measure fairness? Who is excluded from your definition? How do you make those decisions transparent? And ultimately, how do people contest the decisions made by those algorithms? See, I told you it was tricky. Coming at this from two very different perspectives, William and Sylvia started looking into the bigger issue of fairness in algorithms. Even though we had kind of different frameworks, me as a social scientist and Sylvia as a machine learning researcher, the actual overlap between how we would approach this and basically the assumptions that are embedded within it were remarkably similar. And actually part of us was saying like, oh, like look at these papers in social science that are kind of making this same point. They just hadn't actually had a way to actually communicate that formally. You're listening to a podcast from the people at DeepMind. In April 2019, William and Sylvia co-published a paper on fairness in AI entitled A Causal Bayesian Network's Viewpoint on Fairness. In it, they show that no matter how fair algorithms might be, if the data they're learning from is biased, we still can't trust their results. I don't think it is possible to find technical solutions that are completely satisfactory. At some point, we'll need to take decisions whether the kind of unfairness is acceptable or not. But we can advance a lot, and that's why we need more researchers involved, and not just machine learning researchers, but researchers from different communities to be raising awareness about this, this problem, find solutions, but that's, we will never be able to find completely satisfactory a solution from a technical viewpoint. At that point, we'll need to take decisions. This is important to talk about this such that we are... Something that is missing at the moment. I do think this is fundamentally like a societal, ethical question and challenge. And it will require lots of stakeholders to address. If you have, let's say, a data set, a a facial recognition tool that's designed to find missing children, what threshold do you set as a society where you say, okay, this is acceptable? If we maybe are less successful at identifying children with darker faces, what threshold do we say that's acceptable? Because that's not a technical question, that's a social and political question and normative question. Even if you do have a classifier or a facial recognition software that's fair, the application of it may be in unfair ways. And so that might present a second question that is separate from the actual kind of like if you've decided on the threshold, right, if you're just using it in neighborhoods that are predominantly one group or one ethnicity, that presents a whole other set of challenges for whether or not that's an ethical use of a particular technology. You can't assess whether these algorithms are good or bad in isolation. They don't exist on their own. You have to place them in the context of the world that they're being used, like the criminal justice system or in healthcare. Here's Verity Harding again. This is what I mean by it being a a kind of much bigger discussion that, that potentially the use of algorithms is highlighting. My fear is that people will kind of get a check mark that says, we've tested and this algorithm isn't biased and therefore you should feel free to use it. And that, to me, isn't going far enough. I think there needs to be a further discussion then about, uh, but is this making those decisions that were already bad worse or more quickly and therefore more of them? And, you know, that, that kind of thing. But things are changing. Here's William on what has happened since that ProPublica story broke. They're going back and reconsidering what measures they collect. Right, and going back and trying to create more robust data sets, thinking about who is collecting the actual data itself. Will it be ever perfect? Will we have bias-free, purely pure data? No, I don't think that's that's that. I don't think it's ever going to happen. But I do think that 
people will be skeptical when people ask about what data sets are used and they don't get a satisfactory answer. Right? I do think people will ask, is this data set representative? Does it have balance across different groups? So people will start asking the right questions and interrogating data sets and, and, and models more aggressively, and I think that will lead to better outcomes. And crucially, more people are now being included as part of the conversation. In the aftermath of some of my work and among many others on predictive policing, um, many cities in California actually started implementing citizen boards. So when police departments wanted to acquire a new police technology that included uses of machine learning or artificial intelligence, that they had to go in front of a citizen board and actually have the, the local community evaluate the tool for different metrics, including fairness and bias. Getting different voices involved in the conversation is essential to making sure that we build a future that belongs to all of us. Because what seems obvious to one person just wouldn't occur to another. Your perspective is hard-coded into the work that you create. There are clear examples of this everywhere outside of AI. Able-bodied people designing buildings that disabled people can't use, or new tights and plasters that only work if your skin is one particular colour, presumably the same as the designers. And the algorithms that we've created, they're really highlighting this issue, like the ones used to automatically screen CVs and predict which candidates will fit best in a company. Here's Verity Harding again. If it's based on historically discriminatory hiring decisions by either intentionally or unintentionally biased humans, um, then it's going to kind of recreate those those patterns. Like if you've got a company where white men have succeeded yes. and they're looking for candidates who will succeed, it's going to pick out white male CVs. Yes, exactly. And if the people building the technology are all white males as well, then the likelihood of paying attention to that potential bias and being aware of it. I mean, we all have our blind spots. Um, then, then the likelihood uh, increases. We've seen driverless cars that don't spot pedestrians with darker skin tones, tumour screening algorithms that aren't as effective for patients with ethnicities other than white European, and lots and lots and lots of issues around gender. All of this is kind of inevitable unless you have a range of different viewpoints in your design process. The most important thing, in my point of view, for ensuring that these things are, um, if not, not biased, but that you're being intentional about what you're building and aware of the potential bias, is that your team is a diverse team, is that you have a broad set of voices involved. And... It's actually much simpler to do that than is suggested. And the issue of gender diversity has been a particular focus of late. I think there's plenty of, of young women and girls who are really excited by science and STEM subjects. And it's an easy get out to say that there aren't enough women in STEM and that's why workforces aren't diverse. But actually it's much more about making sure that it's a safe space for women and girls to work, that they're not discriminated against once they're there, that you're able to not just attract and hire them, but that you're able to keep them and, and make sure that it's a place where they feel comfortable working. And so I think it's much more important that we look at how women are treated in science than just dismiss it as something that girls aren't interested in at a young age. Lila Ibrahim, DeepMind COO, is very conscious that diversity is still a problem in the tech sector as a whole. Talk about things that keep me up at night, right? So here I am, a uh, professional of uh, 25 plus years with an engineering background, uh, a mom also raising nine-year-old twin daughters. I would have hoped by now we would have solved the problem, and yet we haven't. We're like at the same, the, the numbers are flat. But there are steps being taken to address it. There's the short-term stuff you can do, which are, are things like you diversify your candidate pools. You, If you're doing university recruiting, you look at a broad range of universities and ones that have um, 
that have a, a broader student representation and have support structures often in, in place to help those students through their academic and communities. Um, you look at job descriptions and ensure that you don't have unconscious bias reflected in your job descriptions. You So once you're in the recruiting pipeline, then you may t- need to make sure candidates have the right experience. We are being very deliberate about how we invest back in education. AI is something that will change future generations. So how do we make this a field that's more accessible? So for example, um, whether it's uh, funding diversity scholars in universities or funding AI chairs in universities to try to increase the pipeline. And I think that helps uh, fuel some of the academic aspects as well as support our like, long-term recruiting This isn't just tokenism that we're talking about here. This is about making better technology. Diversity and diverse perspectives will create AGI faster and safer and with just a better better result. Because one of the things I worry about is how do we avoid our own internal bias? A lot of the work around deep reinforcement learning started from specific pockets, and many people grew up in those labs or those universities, and you know we, they, they brought their former colleagues, and so we have a pretty strong network of people that have known each other for a long time, which is fantastic, and they can really advance certain aspects of our, of our work, and yet there are other areas that are emerging. Um, how do you teach curiosity? How do you... Um, How do we ensure that we minimize bias in the code that we're writing? Who's to say uh, what intelligence is and isn't unless you have a better representation from society? And and that's just on the research side. On the operation side, too, you think about things like, okay, think about public policy. Like, if you're asking governments to think about how they're going to treat artificial intelligence, then you want people that are representative of the the constituents of the population. If we want to uh, be focused on education, making sure that we're not just focused on the specific schools, but a broader range, so we're bringing more people into the space. I just think it's going to be imperative for us to truly solve intelligence, that we're just going to need to have more diversity. So is part of the, well, solution is probably a bit grand, the word to suggest, but it's, it's part of the way forward making ethics a, a kind of keystone at every stage of the process rather than having it as an afterthought. Oh, absolutely. We have to be thinking about our responsibility for the technology we develop and to, candidly, to society as a whole, every step along the way. And I think that there's something quite special about being headquartered out of London versus being based out of Silicon Valley. I love Silicon Valley. It's where my career has has really developed. And yet you're surrounded by technologists, you know, from the billboard signs to the marketing and promotion. Here in London, it's so multicultural and I feel like it's part of your daily life. You need to be thinking about the work that you're doing and how it is going to impact all the people around you. But of course, we can't just leave the solution solely in the hands of the people who are designing these things. It's our future too. The public and government should also have a hand in this. My impression is that people want to understand what they're using and want to understand what makes it work and how it works. But they, more importantly, want their representatives and the people tasked with keeping them safe and secure to understand it too. And I think that's why we've seen a bit of a breakdown in recent times. If you want to know more about ethics, diversity and fairness, then head over to the show notes where you can also explore the world of AI research beyond DeepMind. And we'd welcome your feedback or your questions on any aspects of artificial intelligence that we're covering in this series. So if you want to join in the discussion or point us to stories or resources that you think other listeners would find helpful, then please let us know. You can message us on Twitter or you can email us podcast at deepmind.com.